Live from San Francisco, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering VMworld 2015. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem sponsors. And now your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to Moscone, everybody. This is theCUBE. theCUBE is in its sixth year at VMworld. We're here at VMworld 2015 in Moscone North. The Cube goes out, we extract the signal from the noise. Our friend Rob Streche is here. He's with HP. We're going to talk hyperconvergence. Rob, great to see you again. Thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. So, you know, Stu, we've been covering, you know, this whole space. You know, we came out with a server sand forecast a couple years ago. You guys, you know, came out right at the top of the, the top of the list. So let's start with sort of what hyperconvergence is to you guys. You know, the yeah. thing we like about hyperconvergence is, you know, unlike software defined, I mean, hyperconvergence kind of came up out of the community. You know, some one of the alpha geeks I think coined it. You know, so it's not a vendor term, right? right. It's something that came from the community. But so what? What does it all mean to you and HP? Yeah. Yeah. So I think at HP we look at it as an extension of ease of management, ease of deployment. How do you get something up and running where I don't need a specialist? And for us, uh, really that takes the form of our CS250 store virtual product, which is our four node in one appliance product that comes up, it's pre-integrated with VMware. Uh, you buy the licenses, you light it up in 15 minutes or less. I, I think what it means is that there's a new design point, and I think a lot of people across the industry are really looking at it as, I don't want to have a storage specialist anymore. I really need to understand and how to bring a cloud admin, a VMware admin, a virtualization admin in general, and they need to be able to deploy all the way up to almost the DevOps layer, like you know the nice talk about Ansible and Puppet and Chef, and how can I integrate in with those so people don't even need to know what the infrastructure is. Uh, and I think you know we also talk about composable infrastructure and how it's CPU memory and storage and used in different ways to solve application use cases or workloads. That's kind of where we look at it playing is it's, it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle from our perspective though. So it's coming, you're saying the driver is coming from the sort of from the customer base standpoint, middle, middle out, middle up, <laughs> not really top down or even necessarily bottoms up. It's that, that mid-level company that has it big enough to have problems, but right. doesn't have the skill sets to be able to just have these separate silos of, of expertise. Yeah, exactly. I, I think a lot of where we see hyperconvergence being uh, adopted mainly is robo. So I don't have IT people in Indonesia, but I need a product that I can put in there that can quickly come up with people just plugging it in, plugging in some ethernet cables, and I'm up and running. How do I get to there? and have the data services that stretch back to my core and may not be hyper-converged back in the core. Uh, because companies are sweating their assets a lot longer these days and they're looking for how do I bridge the gap between hyper-converged and non-hyper-converged or traditional uh, infrastructure that they're having there. So talk a little bit about what you guys announced a couple weeks ago leading up to VMworld and what you're showing here and what the reaction is from customers. Sure, so about two weeks ago we announced the next version on our Gen 9 ProLiant hardware of our CS200 family and it's our CS250 uh, store virtual and what it is doing is bringing uh, VMware's 5.5 or 6.0 pre-integrated into a three or four node configuration, so a lower price point for the three node, obviously. Uh, we also put in there, uh, as part of the package, three four terabyte licenses of our software only product. And the reason we did that was customers had been telling us for the past six months, how do I get DR quickly and affordably without having to buy yet another box to put somewhere else? So part of what we did was by putting the VSA software, our virtual storage appliance software in there, it allows us to uh, help them get higher ROI out of existing infrastructure back in their core. They just put those VSAs there. Yeah, so Rob, you know, one, one of the things people have had a little bit of difficulty understanding in this space is, you, you described it as an evolution. Some people say, no, no, it's a revolution. It's <laughs> these new companies coming out, uh, you know, in, in, in the valley or, you know, even in our neck of the woods, right. uh, you know, up in Massachusetts, uh, where, you know, I'm, I'm re-architecting, I'm taking the old way, I'm putting it together, um, and, you know, VMware's VSA 
didn't do great in the marketplace. Right. And therefore, uh, there, there are some that look at that, oh, well, that, that was a failed attempt. The, the, leg, the history of the software product that, that, that went into the announcement, I mean, been along for a lot of years. I mean, those of us been around yeah. remember, it was left hand, that was a great iSCSI solution. Right. HP bought it, it was the first VSA, when we talked about software defined, it was there. So, can, can you walk us through a little bit about the, you know, what's been re-architected, what's right. still there, and you know, wh wh why does it have a right to be in the discussion yeah. with all this, you know, cool, buzzy, yeah. new stuff? Yeah, I, th I think that's great. I think, it, you know, we've all been around the industry for a while, and everything that's old is new again, right? I mean, virtualization's not new. Uh, what, where we're going with, uh, you know, uh, software-defined data centers isn't new. Composable infrastructure isn't new. I mean, a lot of this has been there in the mainframe for decades. Uh, I kind of look at our VSA technology being eight years in, uh, you know, as the grandfather, or as somebody called it, I believe, James Brown of software-defined storage, uh, which I like better than grandfather. <laughs> uh, and you look at it and say, well, why is it in the conversation? Well, you still need these robust data services. And I think storage technology is difficult. We've had eight years of working with our customers on this and getting it right. Uh, I think that what did change, and I think what, uh, you know, the people who are out there, the startups who are out there, capitalized on the change of operations, and they got simplicity really well, and they get it. So how fast can you get up and running? How easy is it to manage day to day? They did a good job with that, and I, I give our, you know, competitors a really, you know, high marks on that. I think what's different now is we've simplified that. So using abstraction layers like VMware's vCenter, so that's where you go in our one view for VMware vCenter plugin, and you're able to now have that single pane of glass in there and do your day-to-day -day management. Because what we found is our customers didn't want to move context from VMware into our management consoles and then back again. They want everything to be in one spot. Yeah, so uh, would, would you say, is it a uh, virtualization admin, some of the of VMware, um, is it that simple, do I just use vCenter, uh, is yeah. this an extent of what they do, and kind of compare contrast to, you know, how if this was two years ago, right. uh, the, the solution looked. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly where we're headed. I, I think that uh, we would like a lot more of our stuff to be exposed through there, and we're going there, and that's with each release. We do about four releases of that software a year, and each release it gets simpler, uh, not only for our hyper-converged systems, but for our three-par systems as well. So what we found is that people just want to abstract it down, and I think that you know, as we keep going each release, that's where people want to be. They're not looking to have a, yet another single pane of glass. And I, I think that's where some of the hyper-converged people forcing you outside of vCenter, or if it's in a Microsoft environment being forced out of uh, you know, their operations management framework with SCOM uh, and VMM, it really doesn't play well in those. So, it leads me to my so next question, which is you got all these mega trends. You got cloud, you got, you know, op open, open stack, you got, right. you got containers now popping up. Um, what does all that mean from the hyper-converged standpoint? Yeah. And what's HP strategy around those? Yeah, so I, I think you'll see us, uh, part of the reason why we've leveraged the store virtual uh, underlying technology is that it, right now, today, it already plays on Hyper-V, it already plays in KVM. We have it as a standard feature of our Helion OpenStack, so if you go buy a license of Helion OpenStack, you get a license for that server of store virtual. It's part of the solution. It's part of the solution. There's no, uh, and we do a lot of integration, you know, we'll probably be for Liberty in about a month now, uh, we'll be one of the, top contributor, if not the top number one contributor in lines of code. And you'll see we'll bring new things for Cinder and Manila, which are the, the APIs. I think that's really the key is the API economy as uh, you know, Meg started to talk about, it's more the workload economy and how do we keep moving that forward is really going to change things. And it's how do we keep that in mind for our customers because they don't care about hypervisor as much. They want to know it's supported, five nines, available and cost effective. And I, I think that's where we're focused is on how to make it more cost effective. So, so, so Rob, uh, we talk about use cases, you know, does the, you know, we look at hyperconverge. is this a robo solution? Is this the, 
on-premises version of my hybrid cloud, um, all of the above, uh, you know, how, how do you yeah. see that playing out and how, how does HP uh, solution yeah. set fit that? So we look at it as being really uh, nicely set for things like VDI, which has been one of the main use cases. We also see it for departmental databases, uh, manufacturing and oil and exploration production uh, has really, because these things can go into uh, areas that are hostile environments. Uh, so we have people who run uh, things like SAP for their manufacturing, but they need five nines. And they want to do a stretch cluster across their manufacturing facility because if one side of the factory, if they're doing stuff that is volatile, blows up, they need to still be able to run the control systems on the other side. So that criticality is really some of the use cases we're seeing for it. All right, so here at VMworld last year, you know, the, the vSAN Evo family uh, announcement were, yeah. were really big. Everybody was talking about right. hyperconverged. I fast forward a year and vSAN's important. I've talked to some vSAN customers. Most of them are taking vSAN, not a ready node, not an Evo. They're, they're right. kind of building their own stack. Uh, Evo Rail, uh, I, don't hear it discussed as much, and the Evo SDDC's yeah. coming out next year. So, bring us up, you know, what, what, what's, yeah. what's the HP relationship there? What are you hearing from customers at yep. the show? Yeah, so I mean, the, the elephant in the room that we discontinued Evo, uh, you know, about a month ago, uh, and we're really focusing on our relationship with them and the pre-integration that we do do still with ESX, and uh, we are building on that relationship, which is a 15-year relationship. We still resell uh, vSAN, uh, as you know, uh, and we have more vSAN ready nodes than any other uh, partner of VMware still. Yeah. So. Any commentary, I, I know you've got the solution set, customer adoption yeah. of vSAN in general? Um, I don't, we don't comment on specific sales numbers uh, for specific product lines. Uh, we have a lot of uh, VMware certified people around the world that are helping customers with it. So I think what we've seen is that just in the hyper-converged space and in the storage space, it made more sense for us to focus on our intellectual property from the store virtual side. Uh, it also allowed us to have a little bit more uh, configuration leniency uh, based on it, you know, Rail was a reference architecture, whereas we can focus on meeting some uh, more flexible needs of our customers quickly. Yes. So, so I know you don't, uh, you know, share numbers from from the vSAN, yeah. but from Store Virtual, I mean, you've got thousands of customers that have been yeah. using it years. Um, our, our estimated revenue showed that you know your hyperconverged segment yeah. you know, grew over 50% revenue-wise, and had you as one of the top players in that space. Uh, right. Any numbers you can share? I, I can't share any specific numbers about it. I can say that uh, our sales of the hyperconverged platform have been very robust, and I, I think that. Um, we're looking forward to uh, revisiting the numbers in the hyperconverged market over the course of the year here. And you know, we've only been out for six months. We're on our second generation platform already, and I think that it's really uh, hitting that inflection point. And Rob, it sounds like you've got pretty clear swim lanes between the hyperconverged and so sort of the rest of the, the, the portfolio. Mm -hmm. is, that, is, is that, well, I think that's fair to say, based on, the, but from a positioning standpoint, do those swim lanes start to get, you know, some gray area and, and clouded, or like how far can it go? Yeah, so, so it's naturally, I think that if you look at, a good customer example was I have a, a SQL database that's 24 vCPUs with 50 terabyte data set. Do I do that on hyperconverged or not? And where do I do that? Everybody else is going to say, you go, of course you do hyperconverged or you do you know, it this way. We can look at that and say, you know what, really that should be on uh, Blades or on a DL platform and a, an all flash array. And I think part of what we try to do is really uh, make sure it works for the customer versus trying to force feed hyperconverged. Even though I'm the hyperconverged guy, yeah. I still know in reality our customers are going to look at where does it fit. Okay, last question. Question, Rob. So, what should we be watching? You know, I mean, you guys are on a pretty fast cadence of announcements. We got yep. HP Discover coming up um, at the end of the year. Right. Without giving specifics, what are the things that observers should be paying attention to? Indicators of, of success, momentum, yep. progress? Yeah, so we'll be rolling out uh, and discussing and having a lot of our customers out there uh, talking about the solutions that they've done, both in the build your own space with software defined storage as well in the hyperconverged space. I think you'll see us with a number of product announcements between now and Discover, including Discover, mm. uh, that will take where we are today to the next level. 
Uh, and I think there's some indicators about bringing the families closer together uh, across the storage portfolio that we'll be announcing as well over the course of the year. Awesome, well Rob, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. Well, HP, we're seeing the evolution of the, the, the portfolio and a lot of success, so congratulations on that and well, really appreciate you much. coming on. Much All right, appreciate. keep it right there everybody, we'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from Moscone 2015 VMworld, right back. <laughs>